talk just for a moment about film and media. Um, this is again uh, through the internet, through YouTube, through easy access to DVDs, the inexpensive reproduction of these kinds of media. Uh, more and more Christians are using those as a tool for evangelism. And there are great advantages to that. They're, they're easily accessible, especially when they're online. Uh, they're visual and um, they can be uh, handed out and you can hand out a, a DVD and say, hey, watch this video and we'll talk about it next week. And um, so they're appropriate for many situations. And perhaps the most famous of this is the Jesus film. There have been literally hundreds of millions of people who have seen the Jesus film. And uh, according to their reports, also millions who through this film have made some kind of a decision for Jesus Christ. Uh, the Jesus film is basically sort of a, a narrative of the Gospel of Luke, uh, of the life of Christ, his teachings, death and resurrection. Most of you have probably seen the Jesus film or even used it. What are some of the advantages to the Jesus film? Well, as we were saying, it's a narrative communication of the Gospel. It's not real abstract, very visual. You just follow the life of Jesus and his teachings. You have the visual impact of a film. The visual is, is you know, very impactful. When a person is watching that film, they're taken up in the emotions and the facial expressions and the movement of, of the story. So it's very, very impacting from the sensual point of view. In many places, you can draw a crowd by showing a film, especially in, in uh, rural or tribal settings where uh, media is not as widespread. Uh, certainly the showing of the Jesus film in places like Africa or Indonesia or some of these places, quite an attraction to put up a screen in, in the evening outdoors and show a movie. And so, uh, of course, you have to drag along your generator and, and create your own electricity in a lot of these places, but uh, uh, you can draw a crowd. Now, especially in non-Western settings, because this Jesus film is, is set in Israel and sort of with dusty roads, there's no asphalt roads there and no media, no cell phones, uh, no technology. It's, it's set as the world as we think it was in Jesus' day. And Jesus is walking in from place to place, not even riding a bicycle. People in non-Western cultures go, wow. In fact, there's been testimonies that people said, you know, I always thought Jesus in the Bible was in Europe or in America, because Christians are, most Christians are Europeans or Americans. But when I saw that movie, I thought, well, Jesus lives in the world like the world I live in. I can relate to Jesus now. And so some people have really overcome part of that cultural bias just by seeing that film and saying, wow, I can relate to the world of Jesus. Jesus can probably relate to me. And the Jesus film has been translated into over 1,100 languages. And so here you can use mother tongue communication. That's a lot of languages. And so wherever you're working in the world, you can probably find a version of the Jesus film in a language that your audience will understand and speak into their mother tongue. Of course, the lips are moving this way and the sound is going this way, so that may confuse a few people, but um, essentially you have the advantage of having a mother tongue communication and, and that may be a language you don't know yourself or, or not very proficient in. Now, having said that, there are a few limitations and there can be some difficulties with the Jesus film also. Um, what are some of those? I, I have listed here an article that was published in Missiology a few years back uh, that had some very uh, interesting examples of, of some of the problems that have arisen with the Jesus film. For one, the, the visual is more powerful than the verbal. And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but there is a lot of interpretation that goes into that visual of what the situation was like, uh, the body language that Jesus used. And some of those visual images are not necessarily universally understood. And so the scripture is, even though it's in the setting of the first century in Israel and so on, the scripture is being interpreted and culturally framed. Now, probably the, the more serious issue here are some of the gestures or even objects or the sense of time 
that the film communicates. For there was one example where Jesus in the movie, he has sort of a little uh, bag uh, that he carries along with him. And um, some of the people in one group said, ah, now we know how he does those, those miracles because the shaman in our culture carries his magical potions in one of those little bags like Jesus has. Well, that was just an object in the movie that probably the producers didn't even think about. Um, and maybe Jesus carried such a bag, but he certainly didn't have magical potence in that bag. But that's what the people interpreted. Um, or gestures, um, the clothing Jesus wore. There was one debate that even though Jesus had a beard, he had this, this long hair. Was Jesus really a man or was he a woman? Um, and uh, so these kinds of things can sometimes be a bit of a distraction. Uh, but... Uh, or the sense of time that Jesus could move from one place to another so quickly. People who are not used to film or Hollywood productions, um, they get uh, a little confused by some of that. Uh, and that's just the general unfamiliarity with the medium. Now, of course, in most parts of the world, people are familiar with film and movies and television, and so it's not so confusing. But in some places, that's a little bit confusing. Uh, there's a scene at the end of the Jesus movie where the camera is sort of a bird's eye view and the disciples are looking up. And if you've never climbed up in a tree and looked down like that, it's, it's kind of a strange perspective. It has confused people. Or again, the, the sense of timing, of uh, distances and so on. Uh, the life of Jesus was so short. Was it only two hours long? Well, of course not. But uh, that, those kinds of confusion can sometimes happen. Now, one other thing, too, is that even though the setting of the Jesus film is uh, in Israel and, and all the props and everything are sort of in that first century mode, the, the actor who plays the person of Jesus is really very European looking. <laughs> he, he doesn't look especially like a Middle Easterner. Um, he, he certainly doesn't look like an African, a sub-Saharan African or an Asian. And so that sometimes confuses people a little bit. Uh, they say, ah, Jesus was a Westerner after all. Um, I'd like to know what shampoo Jesus used in the Jesus film. His hair is always so perfect and clean. And I wonder if first century people living in that dusty world of Israel had such clean, perfect, beautiful hair. I, I don't know. But that's just a thought that's occurred to me as I've watched the Jesus film. It wasn't a major distraction, but, you know. Uh, and so Jesus, Jesus is a Westerner. So, no, the Jesus film is not perfect, but... Fact of the matter is, God has used this film to touch literally millions of lives. And it is an evangelistic tool that can be used in many places. I remember using it even in Germany. We had a Chinese person who uh, was from mainland China. He knew virtually nothing about Jesus. He knew Jesus was the founder of Christianity. That was about it. He, he knew really zero about the life of Christ. Uh, this was some years ago. And so... Um, you know, we had him over at a home and we showed the Jesus film. And uh, after the end of that film, he said, well, now I can understand why people could believe in Jesus. He, Jesus comes across as a compassionate, caring person. Sometimes people weep when they see Jesus being crucified because throughout the film, they've come to appreciate Jesus is caring. Jesus is a teacher. Um, Jesus does miracles. He helps people. You know, and then he would be crucified, and that the love of God for us like this. So it can be very moving. And, and this person said, yeah, now I can understand why people could believe in Jesus. Otherwise, you know, Jesus would just sort of this uh, founder of a religion who lived a long time ago and uh, couldn't relate to that at all. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, as a final point here, the follow-up and discipleship. Remember on our scale we were talking that it's not only a matter of, it's not only a matter of leading people to that point of decision for Christ. We need to be following up and helping people grow in their walk with Christ. And we need to be making sure that the methods we use of evangelism in a natural way help people transition to walking with Christ and relating to the body of Christ, the church. And sometimes if you've done something like just the Jesus film in an isolated sort of situation, that may bring the person to here, but because it wasn't somehow related to other Christians or the life of the church, there's a whole other process of then helping that person 
become a part of a fellowship with Christians, helping that person go the next step to grow in his walk with Christ. And so we need to be very intentional about leading people from that initial faith decision to becoming committed followers of Christ and relating to the body of Christ, becoming a part of that Christian community that they're going to need to grow in their walk. And so we've, we've got to be thinking about that. Sometimes at the evangelistic events we'd have, sort of a larger event, we would immediately invite people to a follow-up Bible study. We would have invitations we would hand out. We would announce it. We would send them a, a written letter afterwards saying, hey, you know, it's, we're, we're continuing on. This is only the beginning. We'd have personal phone calls or visits. Uh, we'd say, can we pick you up and bring you to this follow-up group? It was very essential, especially really in the first week after a person makes some kind of a decision, especially if they're strangers, especially if they haven't had a relationship with Christians. If they've already had a relationship with Christians over time, then it's natural because they know the people. But especially if you've had a larger public sort of event and somebody indicates some kind of a, a desire to know more about Christ, really within the first few days you want to be following up. You want to be helping that person make those next steps while the interest is still there. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. Now this, I'm going to uh, um, say just a few words about advertising and media because that's a whole other uh, aspect about not just making the church known, but making the gospel known. And um, in some places, you're just not going to be able to do that. Uh, there are restrictions, government restrictions, or uh, it would be counterproductive to try and advertise much. But you can take advantage often of newspapers if they're willing to report on the activities of your church. Um, you can, um, I've actually written the article for them. This is kind of a funny thing that happened one time we would write press releases. And uh, if you write the press release yourself, then you can make sure that the press is getting at least accurate information. They may put a spin on it that's negative, but at least they're getting accurate information. So one time we kind of wrote up uh, a press release and literally the newspaper printed it verbatim, word for word, the way we sent it to them. Couldn't have asked for better in a way. Um, and so be thinking about the media because people tend to believe what's written in newspapers. People tend to believe what they hear on the radio. And so if you can have a positive relationship with people in the media, you know, go get to know the, the local editor of the newspaper or the religion editor of the newspaper. Um, if you can build relationships like that or you have people in your church, your contacts that can build those relationships, they can be very, very helpful um, in just making sure that the information that goes out to the public is accurate. If you do want to announce public events or service events, that uh, you have the media on your side. 